Hi. Today's lecture is going to be an introduction to hypothesis testing. This corresponds to section 4.1 in the Lock 5 textbook. So there's really two key ideas to get out of this section, and that's null hypothesis and alternative hypotheses, and how these uh, competing hypotheses come into play when we are doing something known as statistical tests. So as a reminder, what, why we're doing statistics and why we're collecting samples is because we want to use the data from those samples to calculate some sort of statistic which we're then going to use to make some sort of conclusion or inference about a population parameter. And so this is what is known as statistical inference, is the idea of using data from a sample to make conclusions about a population. So far we've learned one type of statistical inference and this is what's known as estimation. Specifically, we've learned about confidence intervals. So confidence intervals are the first form of inference that we've learned about. We've learned that what a confidence interval does is it gives us a range of plausible values for our population parameter. And we've learned that to calculate a confidence interval, we can either use a formula or we can use a percentile method. The percentile method depends on using something called a bootstrap distribution, and the formula-based method also depends on something uh, called a bootstrap distribution. But instead of using the percentiles in the bootstrap distribution, what we use is the standard error. But now we're going to learn about is what is known as testing. So testing is going to differ from an estimation uh, approach in the sense that we're going to ultimately test some specific hypothesis. Whereas in an interval, what we're really looking to see are what are the range of plausible values. So these two ideas are actually really related to one another. Let's begin with an example. And this is the same example that's covered in your textbook. So it's about the effect of light at night on weight gain in mice. So Studies have shown that exposure to light at night can be harmful to human health. And so light at night, this includes things like televisions or exposure to computer screens or your iPhones or, or Android phones. So really any sort of exposure like that at night. And so what one study did is they randomly assigned 18 mice to either a light condition where they were exposed to light at night or to a dark condition where they had what we would sort of consider the normal circadian pattern uh, for, for light exposure. That is, you see light during the day, and nighttime it's dark. So these mice that were in the light condition were exposed to light pretty much all the time, and the mice that were in the dark condition were exposed to the normal light-dark cycle. And what they wanted to look at was body mass gain. So that's what one of these uh, outcomes that has been sort of suggested as being a negative consequence of being exposed to light during all the time is weight gain, and they examined this model using mice. So I have three questions down here. The first question is, what are the cases and units in this study? Hopefully at this particular point, this answering this question is reasonably straightforward and that is mice. And we know it's mice because they're the, the things that they're collecting the data on, right? So remember, cases or units are the things you collect the data on. The next question says, can we conclude causation? Now, how do we conclude causation? In this class, we've said causation comes from random assignment, which, comes, which is something that occurs in a randomized experiment. And if we look at the second bullet here, we see that it says that there was ran they were randomly assigned. So that means we can conclude causation. So if we find that there's a difference in weight gain between these two uh, groups, these two conditions, we can conclude that the condition caused weight gain. Okay, It's not just an association, it's a causal relationship. The final question says, what is the parameter of interest? So this one's a little more tricky. Remember, there's a handful of parameters that we've talked about. We've talked about P, which is a proportion. Oops. We've talked about P, which is a proportion. We've talked about P1 minus P2, which is the proportion in one group minus the proportion in the second group. We've talked about mu, which is the mean. We've talked about mu1 minus mu2, which would be the mean of one group minus the mean of the second group. 
And then we've talked about R, which is a correlation. So when we're asking what is the parameter of interest, it has to be one of these five. Now, the variable that we measured is mass gain. So is mass gain going to be a categorical or a quantitative variable? Hopefully, you notice that it's a quantitative variable. And because it's a quantitative variable, that means we're going to be looking at a mu. Now, we now know then that we're at this line right here. It's either going to be mu or it's going to be mu1 minus mu2. Well, let's go back to this little blurb up here. We see that we have a light condition and we have a dark condition. So really what we're going to be interested in is the difference in those two conditions, their average body mass gain. So that's going to be mu of light minus mu of dark. This is going to be our parameter of interest. And we're going to estimate that by x bar of light minus x bar of dark. And this right here is going to represent our best estimate, right? And it's going to be what I'm calling a point estimate. And we know that what we could do is we could use a bootstrap to calculate a standard error to come up with a confidence interval to give us a range of possible values for that. But we're going to do something slightly different. But this is our parameter of interest, and here's our sample statistic. Now let's look at the data. So this is a dot plot, and on the top is the dark condition, and on the bottom is the light condition. Now we want to compare these two conditions in terms of does it look like there's an effect of condition on weight gain? Well, if we were to calculate just sort of eyeballing it, the average uh, weight gain for dark is probably somewhere around here, right? I think that that's probably fairly a fairly good guess. Whereas for the light condition, it looks like maybe, you know, our data is spread out over a much greater area. It might be around seven, or maybe a little bit above seven. And we do see that there's this one individual out here who I would say is an outlier. So if you were looking at this data, you would probably call this an outlier. Now, we can't really say much about the shape of these distributions. We could talk about the variability. There's clearly more variability for light than there is for dark. Um, but it looks like, in general, that mice that were in the light condition gained more weight than mice that were in the dark condition. Well, let's look at the actual numbers. So we see that the x bar for light the sample mean uh, weight gain for mice that were in the light condition was 6.72 grams. For those that were in the dark condition, it was 4.114 grams. This corresponds to a difference in those two means of 2.618 grams. So if we come back here, oops, we see that my mean probably should have been over here, which is okay. We were just eyeballing it. So we're saying though, that this mean for the bottom group is greater than the mean for the second group by 2.618. So what could be the cause of this difference? This is kind of, this is one thing to think about when you were doing statistics. Now we know that we said that the cause is going to be in this case, the condition if we see an effect, right? But there's always really two causes beyond, there's really always two causes in a study, I would argue. The first is that what you're just observing is just randomness. So the fact that you see that there's these two differences between these two groups just happened by chance. It happened by random. So it was just by chance. Just by chance, do these two uh, these uh, mice in these two groups, do they happen to be different? So then, the other cause is that it's not by chance. It's not at random. So I would say we would, this is really the situation we're always in. It's either, it's either by chance or it's not by chance. And so then when we want to understand why it's not by chance, that's really when we start to sort of get into the nuance of the design of the study. So provided that these results were not, are not caused by randomness, we could say that they were due to the condition.
But what would be great is if we had a way to sort of quantify this notion of randomness, right? Because the fact that 2.618 grams is not zero, and why am I saying zero? Because zero would be a value that we would expect if in fact there was no difference in their uh, weight gain between the two conditions. The fact that this value is not zero, but instead non-zero, how likely would that be to just sort of occur by chance? And that's gonna kind of be the motivating thing that's going to come up when we're looking at hypothesis tests or statistical tests. They're one and the same. So what we do in a statistical test is we want convincing evidence from our sample to make a conclusion about the population. So do we have convincing evidence from our sample to make a conclusion about the population? Oops. Remember that X bar light is a estimate of mu bar light and that X bar dark is an estimate of mu bar dark. Is this 2.61, is the information in this, in, this, uh, in this sample convincing enough for us to conclude something about mu light and mu dark? And what do we mean by that something? That's sort of the thing that we want to think about here, like convincing evidence to make a conclusion about the population, but in what sense? Well, what we need to do is set up two competing hypotheses. And you're always going to set up two competing hypotheses. The first is a null hypothesis. And this is a claim of no effect or no difference. So in our previous example, a null hypothesis would be a hy hypothesis that there's no difference in average weight gain between the two groups. An alternative hypothesis, instead, is a claim for which we're seeking evidence. This is actually the hypothesis that we're interested in. And don't confuse this with the notion of the way in which you think about hypothesis more generally in science. I mean, it, it does map on to an alternative hypothesis, and that's generally what you think about. But the non alternative hypotheses have very specific meanings. So what we seek to do when we do statistical tests is to answer this question. Does the sample data provide enough evidence for us to reject the null hypothesis and to support the alternative? And I would argue that the way statistics is moving now is that we care less about that formal rejection of the null hypothesis. And what we really care about is how much support do we have for the alternative hypothesis? Now, next class, we'll, we'll talk about what we mean by support. But what we're going to be doing in this lecture is really just figuring out how do we set up the null and alternative hypotheses for our different scenarios. Now, one thing I want you to note is that you never reject the alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> you can only reject your null hypothesis. So we always write our null and our alternative hypotheses in terms of our population parameters. And the reason for that is that, as you'll see, we know what our sample statistics are. So it doesn't make sense to do hypothesis tests about our sample statistics. We know what they are. We want to do statistical tests about our population parameters because we don't know what they are. And that's the purpose of testing, is to come up with a sense of what they could or could not be. So our null hypothesis will nearly always have an equal sign and the alternative will always have a greater than, a less than, or a not equal to sign. And I say we'll nearly always here in stat 120, it will always have this, okay? So you can always write the null hypothesis with an equal sign. Now let's go back to the original problem. It says, does light at night affect weight gain? So our null hypothesis would be that the average weight gain in the light condition is equal to the average weight gain in the dark condition. That's our null hypothesis. It, see how, if you note, it has this equal sign here, and it's, an e, and it's, a, it's a hypothesis of no difference. So there's no difference between these groups. If there's no difference in their, their average weight gain, then they're gonna be equal. The alternative, however, is that the average weight gain in light is not equal to the average weight gain in the, uh, the dark condition, or alternatively, that they're different, okay? 
Now you may ask yourself, why did I use the not equal to sign rather than the greater than or less than sign? And this is because the way this question is written, does light at night affect weight gain? It doesn't say in what way does it affect weight gain? Do I know that light at night is going to increase weight gain or is it going to decrease weight gain? If it's not specified, the direction isn't specified, then you should assume that it's a not equal to sign. Now I know your book uses the greater than, greater than sign when they're doing this example, but the way I sort of phrase this, it's a not equal to sign. But it should become clear as you're going through these problems. We'll look at an example. Is there a home field advantage during the playoffs for major leagues, major league baseballs, major league baseball, not baseballs, excuse me. Suppose we are interested in studying whether there's an advantage to being the home team during the major league baseball playoffs. A home field advantage would imply there's a greater than 50% chance of winning at home. State the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, so let's write these. This is, this is really, this is what you should be able to do by the end of this section is to be able to write hypotheses or begin to start learning how to write hypotheses. So we're gonna write H, H0 and HA are null and alternative hypotheses. We know that there's gonna be an equal sign in here because it always has an equal sign. What we need to figure out is what goes on what side of the equal signs. So the first thing we should figure out is what is our parameter that we're interested in here? So if you're reading through this, it says a home field advantage would imply there's a greater than 50% chance of winning at home. So basically our parameter is gonna be P and that's gonna be the proportion of wins at home. So we're gonna put P in both places, okay? Note it's not p hat. It's not. It's never going to be p hat or x bar or anything like that, because it's going to be, uh, it's going to be for the population parameter. And with that in mind, I think earlier when I wrote a correlation, I wrote it as r, and in fact, it should have been rho, not r. So that is a that is a mistake. Um, but we'll cover correlations later. You don't have to worry about that right now, but the population parameter for correlation is not R, it's rho. So we've got this P equals to, equals, and then we have this P down here. Now we need to figure out what the value the value is here. What would be our null value? Oh, so it says a home field advantage would imply there's a greater than a greater ch greater than 50% chance of winning at home. So that means our null hypothesis is that winning at home is just 50%. That would be our, our, our test of no difference. Our no difference would be just winning at home, which is 50%. Now, the alternative would be that it's greater than 0 0.50. So if you look at these two right here, you'll notice that the only difference between the null and alternative is going to be the sign. And that's always going to be the case. The null hypothesis is always going to have an equal to sign. The alternative is always going to have a not equal to, greater than, or less than. So we looked at the, on the previous slide, we examined whether or not the proportion of games you win at home is greater than 50% as an indicator of home field advantage. Now imagine these four scenarios we have down here. So, so far this year, we've had 15 playoff games in the Major League Baseball season. Now, which of the scenarios below would pro provide the strongest evidence of a home field advantage? Which of the scenarios below would provide the least evidence? Scenario one, the home team wins 11 wins out of 15 games. Scenario two, they win nine games. Scenario three, they win five games. Or scenario four, they win eight games. Well, I hope you look at this and you're like, well, scenario one is going to be the situation where they are going to have the strongest evidence because that's the most games that they've won at home. And then I hope you look at this and you say, well, the weakest evidence or the least evidence is going to be the one where they only do five out of 15 games. I hope that that makes sense to you. Let's look at a different problem. Does a cognitive dissonance based eating disorder program reduce risk to eating disorders? Eating disorders affect 13 to 15% of female individuals. 
adolescent girls with body dissatisfaction, a sample size of 481, were randomly assigned to a dissonance-based thin ideal internalization reduction program, which is known as the body project, or to a control condition. So there's these two conditions with which these young women were randomly assigned. The researchers want to know whether the body project participants experienced a greater decrease in average number of eating disorder symptoms than control participants. So what are the cases and what are the two variables described here? I'm hoping that you see for the cases, it's going to be the females that participated in the study. The two variables that are, that are described are going to be either condition, which is a categorical variable, where it could either be body project or control. And the other variable is going to be eating disorder symptoms. So I'll just say symptoms, but that's shorthand for eating disorder symptoms. So our condition is categorical. Our symptoms are going to be quantitative. So when we have a categorical variable and a quantitative variable, we already know we're dealing with a difference in means. So whatever we're doing is going to be in the form of mu1 minus mu2. That's our parameter of interest. And we know that because we have a categorical variable and a quantitative variable. Was this an experiment or an observational study? I'm hoping when you, when you read through this, you pick up on the idea that it says randomly assigned. Because it was randomly assigned, we know it was an experiment. So now let's state the null and alternative hypotheses. H0, HA. Now I have mu1 minus mu2. We know that those are going to be our parameters here. And we learned earlier that you can write mu1 equals mu2. And then as an alternative, you could have either mu1 not equal to mu2, mu1 is greater than mu2, or mu1 is less than mu2. These, this, this is sort of the way in which we write it. So we should put the mu, we should put the ones and the twos within the context of the problem. So this is going to be for the null hypothesis. It's going to be the mu of the body project is equal to the mu of the control condition. So mu of BP, mu sub BP equals mu sub C. And what it says here is that the researchers want to know whether the body products experience a greater decrease in average number of eating disorders. So this is a decrease. So what we'd want is that that mean number for body project would be less. So we're going to write it like this. And this is because it's a decrease. It wants to be less than. Will that, will, that's the hypothesis that we're really interested in. Now, an alternative way to write this is you can do mu BP minus mu sub C equals zero. And the alternative for the uh, alternative hypothesis is mu sub BP minus mu sub C is less than zero. These are going to be interchangeable, writing it like this. You may prefer to write it the way on the left, or you may prefer to write it the way on the right. And these two are the same because all I've done is I've taken the mu sub c and I've subtracted it from the right hand side to move it over to the left hand side. That's, so these two are going to be mathematically equivalent expressions. Here's another um, example where we're going to look at strength of evidence and trying to understand which one of these uh, best supports the alternative hypothesis and which one provides the least support. So if you remember, the alternative hypothesis is that the average uh, number of eating disorder symptoms is less in the body project than it is in the control. So if we example, examine sample one up here, we see that it looks like probably the average in the body project and the average in the control are very similar. They're about the same. And these are dot plots. Uh, they're, they're a little different than the dot plots that we've seen, but they're effectively dot plots around the center of that line. And so the, in this one, if we were to look at these two, we would guess that the mean of the body project is probably equal to the mean of the control. And these are sample means. In this one, it looks like the mean of the body project is less than the mean of the control. And in this one, the mean of the body project is greater than the mean of the control. So which sample would represent the strongest evidence for the alternative? 
Well, just as a reminder, our null and our alternatives are mu bp is equal to mu c. Mu bp is less than mu sub c. So which one would provide the strongest evidence for the alternative? Well, that's going to be sample two right here. Now, which one provides the strongest evidence against the alternative hypothesis? So not only does, is, does one of them show that there's no difference, but does one of them show that the difference is in the opposite direction that would be hypothesized? The answer is yes, and then that's sample three. So that one would be the answer to that. This one would be the answer to this one. Note that just because the two means are the same in sample one, don't get that confused with the, the, uh, the null hypothesis. The one that shows the weakest evidence or the strongest evidence against the alternative hypothesis is going to be the one that has the results that are in the complete opposite direction than those that were hypothesized. Now we're going to do one more example. So this, this example is, um, well, we've been bringing up the election uh, examples lately because, well, it's relevant and it's really helpful for thinking about proportions. So will Donald Trump win re-election in the 2020 election? So there are two ways we might consider testing whether President Trump wins re-election. The first would be, if President Trump obtains greater than 50% of the vote, he will win re-election. Now, more realistically, and the way in which presidents typically uh, win is if they obtain more votes than their challengers. So if President Trump gets a greater proportion of the vote than Joe Biden, he will win re-election. So for, for uh, these two scenarios, one and two, I'd like you to state both the alternative and the null hypotheses for these roads to re-election for Donald Trump. So let's kind of make a divider here. H0, HA. This will be scenario one. This is going to be scenario two. So in the first scenario, all we're talking about is the proportion of votes that Donald Trump receives. So we know that the proportion, we know that we're, we're talking about a percent, so we know we're talking about the proportion. So our parameter is going to be proportion. And we want to know is the proportion that Donald Trump is going to get going to be greater than 50% or 0 0.50. So we know that our null is going to be equal to 0 0.50. And so our alternative would be that it's greater than 0 0.50 because that's what's specified here. I'm gonna just subscript it, uh, Donald Trump, so that, you, so that that makes sense for the next one. In the next case, if President Trump gets a greater proportion of the vote than Joe Biden, he will win re-election. So in this case, we're talking about not just a single proportion, but a difference in proportions. So we're talking about the proportion of votes that Donald Trump will get and the proportion of votes that Joe Biden will get. And he'll win, Donald Trump will win if he gets a greater proportion. So the, the null hypothesis is going to be that he gets the same amount as Joe Biden. And then the alternative would be that Donald Trump gets greater than Joe Biden. Now this is really scenario two, is really the scenario we kind of think of when we think about um, who will win the presidential election. But of course in this country, popular vote doesn't determine who wins the election, it's the electoral college. So even this is not exactly correct. But this is really just to give you some more practice uh, with hypothesis testing. So I hope that by the end of this lecture that you have a better understanding of, of writing statistical tests and that you understand that statistical test is going to statistical testing is going to be an alternative way in which we're going to do inference.